Robin asked me to introduce her herself, but I don't think I really need to. My name is Tracy Wilson, but I will tell you a little bit about Ronnie that you might not know. Is that Ronnie uh, sings in lots of community choirs, Berkshire Lyric, Berkshire Concert Choir. She sings in this Stockbridge Festival Chorus. She sings in the church choir here. She's on mission in action. She ushers, she's reading tomorrow. She just does so much stuff. You see her at the Lions Gate at Tanglewood all the time. Um, so these things, she also serves as a tutor for people, English and second language people. So she, she's really amazing people. These are things you probably don't really know about Ronnie. Uh, but what we all do know is that when Ronnie walks into a room, her smile lights it up. So here's Ronnie Cunningham. So when I left you before, it was on the green in Bournemouth in spring of 1946. And my mother and my father and Auntie Doris, uh, my mother's, my father's friend, um, were discussing what to do with us as children. So we were sent to play. And we played on the chimes, we walked on the beach, anything a, a child can do at the seaside, we did. And when they indicated to us that they wanted us to come back, we were each given the suitcase that we had taken to the hotel and said goodbye to my mother and we were, went off to London. And we went to stay with friends of Auntie Doris. Their names were Peter and Doris Mitchell, and they had a son, Peter. They did take care of us, but we felt abandoned. There's no question about that. So we started school at the Cold Falls Cold Fall School in Muswell Hill, and then a little while later, Dad and Auntie Doris had rented a room above Mr. Escott's shoe store. And it was on Stroud Green Road. We started in another school and found we were in the wrong district. And then we went to Montem Street School. What can I tell you about Montem Street School? It was divided between an elementary school and and secondary modern school. If you went to secondary modern school, you could go to, at 13, you could take an exam again to an academic track, or you would stay um, and learn a skill. Mr. Escott was a very old man, and he was, all I can say is that he was very curious. <coughs> and wanted to know about this family that was renting a room from him. It was one room with use of kitchen and bath. And we had, the room was quite large. It had a fireplace, a decent sized dining room table, and there was a mattress on either floor of the fireplace. And Michael and I slept on one, and my mother and my dad and Auntie Doris on the other. And something I want to say about Auntie Doris is that she was actually really good to my dad, and was all her life. And of course, as a child, I couldn't recognize that. So Auntie Doris sang, and she sang a song called The Lamp Lighter, the old lamplighter, which I can't sing because I can't be in competition with Bing Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to try a song that she loved a great deal. 
Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London so. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner I think of her wherever I go. I get a funny feeling inside of me just walking up and down. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London town. As you probably know, Britain went into a very long depression after the war, and so it was very hard to find work. It was very hard for anyone to find a place to live. We had many returning servicemen and also refugees. And my dad had been a builder before the war, owned his own company. But instead of building, he did whatever he could find as a carpenter. He often became a shop fitter and did that as well. And Michael and I, Dad would bring home all kinds of bits of wood. They might be varnished or French polished. And Michael and I would go out into the shed and chop it all up so that we could have it in the fireplace. And because Mr. Escott had this sense of curiosity, Auntie Doris asked us to call her mother. Michael did, but I couldn't. I don't know how I referred to her, actually, for many years. So, you know, it's about Halloween time. And when we were at school, we learned all kinds of poems and songs. And I'd like to do this one, because this is very appropriate for Halloween. Someone came knocking at my wee small door. Someone came knocking. I'm sure, sure, sure. I listened. I opened. I looked to left and right. But north there was a stirring in the still dark night. Only the busy beetle tap tapping on the wall. Only from the forest the screech arrows call. Only the cricket whistling while the dew drops fall. But so I know not who came knocking at all, at all, at all. <laughs> that was by Walter Lyle de la Mer. And he also wrote this wonderful song, which was one of the first things I learned at Montem Street School. <clears throat> In Hans Old Mill there's three black cats. Watch the bins for the thieving rask. Whisker and claw, they crouch in the night. Their five eyes are green and bright. Squeaks from the flower sack, squeaks from where the cold wind stirs on the empty stair, squeaking and scampering everywhere. Now down they cow, come now in, now out, with whisking tail and sniffing spout, while lean old hands he snores away. Then up he comes to the brink, to his creaking mill. Out come his cats, all grey with meal. Jekyll and Jessup and one-eyed Jill. <laughs> so the winter of 1946 was bitterly cold and with very, very heavy snowfall. And the behind Montem Street School, where there had been bombed out buildings, they'd been replaced by a prefabricated dormitory. And it was for German prisoners of war waiting to be repatriated back to Germany. And so what do you do when there's a lot of snow? You have snowball fights. So over the fight, over the fence, we were all playing snowball fights with the German prisoners who just a short time ago, we wouldn't have considered doing, doing that. The other thing we did we climbed the joists in bombed out buildings. No stair treads, just the joists. And we'd get all the way up and then figure out how to get back down again. But none of us fell. I think it must have been the age when you can do anything and nothing's going to happen to you. <laughs> so, um, the other thing we learned a lot at Montem Street School were songs about Scotland, Bonnie Prince Charlie, Countdown Races. Now, why they've been teaching that in an English school, who knows? <laughs> um, Swanee River, all sorts of things like that. But I had wanted to sing 
a, a song called Farewell Lancaster. And I know the song from the first note to the end, but we could not find the words. And even though I tried to sum it before I went to bed for, for several nights in a row, the words didn't come back to me. But I'm going to sing something else instead. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on the wing, onward the soldiers cry. Carry the lad that's born to the king over the sea to sky. Loud the wind howls, loud the waves roar, thunder claps rent the air. Buffed are our foes, stand by the shore, follow, they will not dare. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on the wing, over the soldiers cry. Carry the lad that's born to be king, over the sea to sky. Well, amongst all the other decisions that people grown-ups make, um, it was decided that mother was going to come back to London. At this point, we'd been without her for close to 18 months. And I have to say that my older brother, I would cry every night for my mother and for my teddy bear. And my older brother would sit on one of the mattresses, cross-legged, put me on his lap, and sing to me. And he did this every night for a long time, and I've never forgotten it, and he really was a hero. So the decision was to get a room in the Alexandra Court Hotel. Now that sounds as though it's going to be this glorious hotel, but in fact, the name belies it. It was built, it was four or five houses, that had been knocked together into one hotel. It was on the corner of Queen Alexander Drive and Seven Sisters Road. And Michael and I had so much fun there. There was nothing like hide and seek in a place like that. So when mother came to London, she was pregnant and she spent a lot of time knitting and making a layette for what was to be my baby brother. And I made a matinee jacket for my teddy bear. <laughs> of course, I had to take care of my teddy bear. There were wonderful guests in this hotel. There was Mr. Mr. Gaze, who was a retired headmistress, headmaster. Miss Pierce, who would jump on a chair when she saw a mouse and then had to get help to take her off. <laughs> and Mr. Joseph was a fitness instructor, and for some months he gave my older brother, Michael, the boxing lessons, which I observed very carefully. <laughs> and I have to mention Uncle Eric, Eric Branch. He was this large, affable man and very loving and affectionate. And when my mother went to the Bearstead Memorial Hospital in order to have her baby, she and we entrusted Eric implicitly. And he bathed us, he made sure we were up in time for breakfast and ready for school, he always made sure he was there when we came home from school, and, better yet, he made sure we always got ice cream after dinner. <laughs> Mr. Gaze, the headmaster, would sit in the living room after dinner, and I would go down to him and say, give him a book. It was called an encyclopedic dictionary. I don't understand the name, but that's what it was called. And I would say, Mr. Gaze, find any word in there, and I can spell it for you. And my favorite word is aardvark. <laughs> he was left-handed, and we played a lot of cards. 
So when I play cards, I deal cards with my left hand. It's practically the only thing I can do with my left hand. <laughs> and then there was Miriam Smith, one of my schoolmates at Montem Street School. I had been asked to afternoon tea, and I told mother, but I neglected to tell my mother when I was going. And there had been a series of child murders in London at that time, 1947. And all the guests started preying on mother and saying, where's Veronica? What has happened to Veronica? Could this, and just building up her anxiety. And my mother was not normally an anxious person. So I'm coming home from Miriam Smith's and I run into Mr. Gaines. Apparently, many of the guests had gone out looking for me. He happened to be coming up the road that I was coming down. And I said something inane like, hello, Mr. Gaze, fancy seeing you here. And he took my hand and walked me back to the hotel. The hotel, as you can imagine, if it was four or five houses knocked together, you can imagine the size of the garden. It had beautiful flowers and was a wonderful place, particularly for children to play cricket. And we played a lot of cricket. And then there was somebody I would visit on my way home from school every day. His name was Mr. Jack. He was a shoemaker. He'd been in World War I and in fact had been part of that um, Christmas Eve where they played football. Both sides played football together. He wore a collarless shirt um, with braces, suspenders, and um, a, a waistcoat. He was too big for the waistcoat to quite fit. And he had a mouthful of tacks. And talking to him was wonderful because he would be repairing a piece of shoes and every now and then his tongue would come out. <laughs> And I couldn't understand how he could talk <laughs> and have a mouthful of taxi. But he was delightful. And whenever I was troubled about anything, I would just go in for a visit. So, more changes in our lives. Uncle Arthur, my mother's brother-in-law, and her sister, Auntie Avril, came up to London. And mother pooled what was left from selling the house in Bristol into buying a house at 25 Portland Rise. It was a typical London house. It looked as though it was three floors in the front, but there was an area, so that there was actually, if you looked at it from the back, it looked like four floors. Um, we, during that time, we stayed with a Mrs. Benny, and because while the house was being cleaned, it had been a house of ill repute. So there was a lot of work to make it habitable. And mother and Uncle Arthur purchased it together, and of course mother hoped that at some point or other, if she wanted to, she'd be able to take her money out. How can I describe the garden? It was probably as long as this room to the front door. The front part of the garden was a garden, and then the rest had been an old, overgrown rockery. And Michael and I built this little hut called Ye Oldie Shoppy, Shutty Shoppy. <laughs> and it was, it was built out of a kitchen cabinet, the kind you put things in um, to hide them from the flies, one of those things. That was the front door. So in order to get in, we had to get down to about here to get in, and then it's a little taller in the back. And my cousin David and Anne, they built a hut, which was about my height, my current height, and um, most of it was wooden halfway up, and then the rest was covered with sort of drapes, whatever cloth they could find. It was hung all the way around the wall. And it had a fireplace. And one day, in taking wood 
into the fire, to the fireplace. The curtains caught fire. And so there is Anne in the middle of this mess. And two of us went in to get her out. And apart from the smell of fire, she wasn't hurt at all. It was very exciting, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, Michael and I, and Anne and David, and Stuart, my younger brother, shared a living room. Mother, in effect, became the caregiver of my cousins. Um, it was not necessarily a happy arrangement because David and Anne come from a family that were much better off than ours. And having the haves and the have-nots living in the same room and space is not a good idea. Anne could say to her dad, you know, I really want a bicycle, and the bicycle would arrive by the end of the week. And I might say something similar to my mother, I used her old Norman bicycle, but it needed desperately a new saddle, and she'd say, save up for it then. So that's quite a big difference. And one year, I think it was 1953, so just before Michael went into the Navy, we redecorated the room. Um, Michael did the wallpapering, and I painted, and we turned it into a really comfortable, lovely space, and by this time, Anne and, um, no, actually, really, just Auntie Avril had moved out and eventually married Uncle Eric. So, he, in fact, this man that we'd been calling Uncle Eric for years became our uncle. The guest house, we could have 12 guests. And they came from all over the world. South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Ceylon, Ethiopia, Egypt and South America, and many more. And we had a house full of South Africans. They were young women doing their teaching practicum in London. At that time, all education was run according to the University of London. So that when they took their General Certificate of Education O levels, and were accepted in teachers' training, their training actually took place in London. But when you have a house full of South Africans, and you have no knowledge of their politics, what happens when the pastor at St. Martin's in the field calls and said, I have a student at the London School of Economics, and he's from Ethiopia. So my aunt said to her, um, mother, you can't do that. We have a house full of South Africans. They all, they all leave. No, they won't. So what my mother did, she went to, uh, knocked on all the doors and the, the South Africans that were at home. She called them into the living room and she said, Abdul Abdel Nasser from Ethiopia is coming to stay with us. And if you don't like it, you may leave. Now, when the business was just full for the first time, that was really a startling thing for her to do. But of course, they all stayed. One of these South African students was Gita Pinsky, and she became very ill. I don't know what she was ill of, but she was in the hospital, had an operation, I can't remember, I probably knew at the time, had an operation and then went to a convalescent home. And my mother and Michael and I would try and visit her whenever we could. And one day, the doorbell rang, and there was her father. He came personally to thank us for taking such good care of his daughter. And he offered us a house in Durban, South Africa, freehold. And my mother had other things going on in the back of her mind, so we didn't go to South Africa. Excuse me. It was, she was trying to get to Australia 
in time to see her aunts and her grandmother. That was in the back of their head, but children don't know these things. One day, a registered letter came to the house. And if you've lived in England and ever received a registered letter, especially if it's legal paper, it's about this long. The paper itself is lined with linen, and there is a blue stripe making it look like a parcel. And I knew that after Mother read it, she was extraordinarily upset. And so one day, I went to the bureau and read the letter. I couldn't understand many of the words I read, but I did at least understand that it was talking about a divorce. And I had been praying like crazy that a divorce would not happen, because I loved both of my parents, and to see them apart was very difficult. So I decided to talk to my Sunday school teacher. I owned up to the fact that I'd read the registered letter. Miss Ives. Miss Ives, I'm sure from a 10 year and 11 year old's perspective was quite old, but she was probably only in her 50s and 60s. She had never married. She had a bed sit in Wimbledon and she loved children dearly. And so I went to her and told her what was happening. And I asked her to help me pray that my parents wouldn't, would not get a divorce. And then I have to tell you an event that happened in Sunday school. We were talking about the Ten Commandments. And we were discussing, thou shalt not commit adultery. And this elderly lady, got mixed up between adultery and adulterate. So she would be talking about adding water to milk to make it go a little further, or water to wine for that matter. And, and we knew, I mean, we were young enough, but we were also old enough sometimes to know that that wasn't quite true. <laughs> so we went to Sunday school in Green Park. We took the number 19 bus and got out in Piccadilly, and Piccadilly had wonderful car showrooms. Besides Fortnum and Mason's, it had wonderful car showrooms. And there was a Bristol showroom, and Bristol cars were extraordinary. And we would always pass, because we're from Bristol, we always passed and stayed for a long time looking at cars. And then it went from a half, one and a half liter to a two liter engine. And we knew that meant it was more powerful, but what that meant in fact, of course, we had absolutely no idea. The other thing about going to Green Park is that after Sunday school, we would walk in Green Park and sometimes even go as far as Buckingham Palace. And we would see Princess Charles, Prince Charles and Princess Anne out with their nannies and when I think of it now, there are no obvious security around. To me now, that is absolutely astounding. But there they were. I'm sure there were plainclothes men around, but nothing obvious. And the other thing that happened, the Sunday school superintendent said, Veronica, I'd like to see you in my office after Sunday school. And of course, being a child that was always running into, getting into trouble, I thought, uh-oh. What have I done now? Well, she had just received a parcel from America, and in it was an apple green dress, and it was exactly my size. It had long sleeves, and it had this strange buckle arrangement up here, and it was the only thing I had to wear other than my school uniform. I can't tell you how amazing it was to wear, I love my school uniform, which was a good thing, but it was pretty amazing to have something that was not my school uniform. 
I have a photograph of myself wearing it at the Festival of Britain in 1951. But what do you think? I'm wearing it with my school uniform blazer. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. So, living arrangements. Living arrangements at 25 Portland Rise meant that we had a large room, it had a double bed and a twin bed and a cot for Stuart. And so I slept with my mother in the double bed, Stuart obviously in the cot, and my brother Michael in the twin bed. And then when there was no need for a cot for Stuart anymore because he'd pretty much grown out of it, the arrangements changed. I and my mother slept in one bed and Michael slept in the twin bed and we got rid of the cot. So while the room was fairly large, the cot made it feel a lot smaller. I had Saturday morning chores because we had a guest house and if it was full, it was 12 guests and then there were family members, sometimes more and sometimes fewer. I polished every Saturday morning the silver and the brass. Um, one day a week, I helped my mother change all the sheets. In those days, you didn't um, have towels when you went into the guest house. People had to bring their own towels and washcloths. And um, I th probably, I don't know when that changed, but it had not changed by the time I moved on from there. I had to polish shoes. And one day, the shoe polish, black shoe polish, was cracked. And I thought, oh, I can warm it up. So I put it on a very low light on the gas stove. And it fell in. <laughs> so there was a mini fire. I can't remember how I put it out. I believe it was flour, but I honestly can't remember. And the job cleaning it up was awful. But by the time my mother got home, it was all cleaned up and there was a strange smell. But apart from that, everything was fine. So I have to tell you about Auntie Avril and Uncle Arthur. Uncle Arthur worked in the book department, in fact he was the head of the book department, at Bentles, Kingston on Thames, which is a very upper class department store. My aunt worked in, as a, in the city as a comptometer operator, which is a glorified adding machine. So they were rarely at home, and because he was a book buyer, we would often see books when they were just in proof. I read Neville Shute books when they were in these grey paperback covers before they had been properly published. And then he gave Michael, one Christmas, a boy's book of heroes. And he gave me a boy's book of heroines. So the boy's book of heroes was Lawrence of Arabia, Livingston, Mungo Park, and many others. And really enjoyable. I liked the travel side of them. And my book of heroines obviously included Florence Nightingale, who did far much more than nursing. I wrote a paper about her and honestly, she was an extraordinary individual. And Amelia Earhart and Gertrude Bell. And Gertrude Bell was one of those many early 20th century women who would just go off to explore. And reading about her travels was amazing. The other thing that happened was that I went to the um, North London Synagogue because Gladys Aylward was going to give a talk. And you may remember the movie with Ingrid Bergman. It was about the little woman the inner of the sixth happiness. And to hear her talk about her experiences, 
especially trying to become a missionary, because um, all the missionary societies felt she wasn't educated enough, and she, everywhere she applied for anything, she was turned down. And eventually, she found people that would help support her, her travel expenses. And she ended up in China, and as you remember from the film, fell in love with a red officer. Auntie Avril was one of these people that hated noise, any noise, especially any noise I made. <laughs> I laughed too loudly, I spoke too loudly, I sang too much, and goodness gracious, whistle? A whistling woman and a crowing hen is neither good for God nor man, <laughs> or you'll blow your front teeth out. She couldn't stand it. So trying to have the life of a child with somebody like that was very constricting. Uncle Arthur disliked noise as well. And he was in the kitchen one day, shaving. And Stuart had just had an awful bout of asthma. And he had, was recovering enough so that he had this funny little tricycle. It had a handlebar like this, and then coming down from that were a seat. And it had three inch wheels with bumpers around them. So he used his feet to push himself around the room. And of course, he was in the kitchen pushing himself around the kitchen when Uncle Arthur was shaving. Can't you keep that boy quiet? You have to remember, Uncle, you were a little boy once. Well, you did not speak disrespectfully to your elders. And Mother followed me out of the room. And she said, you have to apologize to him. I mean, yes, it was a fact that he was a little boy, but I had been rude. So I had to try and apologize without, in my heart, apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I have to say, since then, I have never apologized for anything if I didn't mean it. So I learned two things in those few years. Do not open a letter that's not addressed to you. And don't apologize if you don't mean it. <laughs> we had a housemaid, Jeannie. She was from Glasgow. And I have to tell you, the order of the house was breakfast and dinner, six days a week, three meals on Sunday. And she, being from Glasgow, she had a very broad dialect. And she would bring home cartoons from the Glasgow newspaper called The Brooms. And it was The Browns. And we would, between us, try and decipher this language that had been written out as it was heard, as opposed to what we would consider English. <laughs> and I don't know why she left. I don't know if she was fired, or after a couple of years had decided she had enough. But suddenly, she was no longer a part of our lives. And she didn't particularly love music, but I do have a song for her. Oh, can ye sew cushions, and can ye sew sheets, and can ye sing baloo when the bairn greets? Oh, hi and ba birdie, oh, he and ba lamb, oh, he and ba birdie, my bonny wee lamb. He, oh, we, oh, what can I do we you? Black's the life that I lead with you. Moany, oh you, little for to gee you. Oh, what can I do with you? Um, I used to get up to things, and one of them was that I would take my lunch money, tuppence, as if I were going to school every day. 
and I had found a place in Finsbury Park where I could sit in the bushes and watch whatever was going on in the lake, but particularly the birds. And I didn't feel alone. I would go to the cafe and use my tuppence to buy a cup of tea and a, lump, and a roll, and then I'd go back to my hiding place. And I'd get home exactly at the time I would if I had been at school. But lo and behold, my absence was noted. <laughs> and my mother had a visit from the truant officer. So, and because I'd been doing other things as well, like stealing a sixpence here and there, um, my mother and the truant officer and I met in Mr. Fisher's, the headmaster's office. And I was essentially told, if you go on like this, you'll be in Borstal or Reform School. Well, that took care of that. In 1948, I took my 11 plus exams. Now, 11 plus, you take them at 10, and then it decides whether you're going to go to a grammar school and have an academic education, or whether you would go to a secondary modern school where you would have a basic education, but also learn a skill. And I passed, and I had a choice of three grammar schools in North London. Dame Owens in Stamford Hill, Highbury Hall High School, and Camden High in Camden. And I decided to go to Highbury Hill High School. I absolutely loved it. Started in the third, oh, I have to explain, the numbers of the classes are very different in Britain than they are from here. So the first form at grammar school is called third form, and it goes third, fourth, upper fourth, fifth, upper fifth, sixth, upper sixth, until you're 18 or so and taking your general certificate advanced levels. So we had 10 weeks of vacation during the entire year. And two weeks at Christmas and New Year's, two weeks around Easter, and then the summer term. And then we had six weeks vacation. It was, you know, what, does, what do children do um, when they have six weeks vacation? Well, I went to work. I worked in a toy factory, um, putting together compendiums of toys. That meant that there would be a game board and all kinds of pieces and many different games in the same box. And as we were paid by the piece, how much we earned in a week depended on how efficient we were. But the other thing that happened was that I went to work for the Women's Institute. The Women's, during the summer, so two summers, I worked for the Women's Institute. And the win Women's Institute, amongst their many other things, delivered meals on wheels in the middle of the day. And while my school was in Islington, in a sort of quietly going downhill part of Islington, where I went delivering w meals on wheels was really run down part of Islington. And there was one apartment flat that I was not allowed to go without the driver because the man had a terrible reputation for his temper and who knows for what else. And all these people, he lived on a pinstriped mattress, he had no pillow and his only covering was his overcoat. And there were so many instances like that. That one day, I was in the living room sitting in the armchair and my mother heard me crying. And she said, Veronica, whatever's the matter? I said, well, I know we're poor, but I've never seen poverty before. So I have to tell you about the differences between Anne and myself. Anne was one of these young women 
that loved all the domesticated arts. She could sew, she could knit, and eventually went on to win prizes for her cakes. She could do anything. I would love to go out on my bike. When I was a sea ranger, I helped to build a 12-man boat on the River Lee, and, you know, anywhere but to be at home. And there were a number of reasons for that. Um, it was... <coughs> my mother met a man who had been in the Navy. He had had several destroyers um, torpedoed from under him, and he had become the chief electrician of the BBC and they dated for quite a little while. Um, one of the good things about knowing him was that ever the horse show, horse of the year show came to Haringey, we were there. When all these American roller skaters came, we were there. We went to vaudeville and all kinds of shows that were being broadcast for Renaissance, the early television, which was a tiny little black box. But he used to come up to say goodnight to me. And I, whenever I had a sense that he was going to be home, I went to the library. The library was my safe haven. And one day, it seems I'm always rude to people, he said something to me and I made a flip remark. And mother followed me out of the kitchen, and she said, Veronica, why are you always so rude to Uncle Jim when he's here? I can't tell you. Started crying all the way up to the top of the house and down to the front hall. And sat on the first step up from the bottom. And it was a lovely sunny day, windy, and we had a leaded light window. So I can still remember all those colors waving across my knee while I was trying to be truthful about something that no 13 or 14 year old should have to talk about. And considering all the other things that I had got up to, my mother believed me implicitly. And she went down to the kitchen and she told him what I had said. And he said, I was only being fatherly. And my mother said, I want you to leave right now and I never want to see you again. So she stood up for me. <laughs> so I have to tell you, that I had a French teacher. All, all our teachers at school either had been married and were widowed because of the war, or they had lost their fiancés. So there was Miss Everybody. So our French teacher was a Miss Barnes. And Miss Barnes was very tall, very, um, looked very severe. And just before school ended one year, she took her class to see Arthur Kitt at the London Palladium. I had fallen in love a long time ago with Eartha Kitt's voice. I can't copy her at all. <laughs> I want an old-fashioned house with an old-fashioned fence and an old-fashioned millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a wonderful, wonderful concert. So, See, I'm getting ahead of myself. I had some good friends at school. One was Thelma Dwyer. And Thelma Dwyer um, lived not far from school, and I was often invited home for tea, which in England, you should understand, is the equivalent of supper. And one day, she said, you know, your raincoat isn't very thick. And she brought out her Wren's overcoat. Now this was, I can't remember the name of a wool, but it was extraordinarily thick. 
It still had its black buttons on it with anchors on them. She had been a wren in the Women's Royal Naval Service during the war, and she gave me this glorious coat. And one day I was there, and she said, how does your mother punish you? And I said, well, if I deserve a good hiding, she uses the, the back of the hairbrush. Fortnum and Mason has this very smooth back, and that's what she used. So a few days later, Thelma came to school, and she didn't want to talk to me. And of course, the reason was she'd been given a good hiding with the back of the hairbrush. But then there were, was Pat Lucas and Pat Hughes. So we three girls, we would go to the boys' school for dances. Um, and there were three boys. Can you imagine these three boys would walk, all three of us, home from school at the end of every day? John Bonniewell was about this tall and nearly as thin as he was tall. Peter Larson was short and blonde, and then there was Brian Boyle, who was very dark complexioned. And when I, we, John particularly, when I went to school dances, he and I would dance. We learned the quick step to Victor Sylvester, who was a wonderful dance orchestra. And, um, you know, we, we danced to Mr. Sandman, Bring Me a Dream and all those wonderful quick step. But this was the time when Edwardian suits for young men, before the Beatles, were becoming really popular. Very narrow straight jackets, long, down to about here. Very stovepipe-like trousers and velvet collars. And a dance came out, if you can call it that, called the Wriggle. <laughs> and you danced with your partner like this. You took two steps forward and one step back, and, that, and you progressed, but it was very, very slow. So John and I decided we were going to t double time it around the room. And we had a lot of fun, even though others were, other kids were annoyed at us. <laughs> then, Stanford Hill, 2428. I'm calling in response to your advertisement. Mother, there's an American on the phone. Advertisement, advertisement. Wendell Ede Clark from Danbury, Connecticut. He had just come out of the Air Force in Japan. He was served four and a half years in Japan. And he was an actor. And he looked like Abraham Lincoln. And he was this incredible individual. He and mother talked about Gilbert and Sullivan and sang Gilbert and Sullivan a lot. And we were, happened to be associate members of the Mount View Little Theatre, which was a theatre originally started by two Navy men in Gibraltar during the war. And it put on a play every other week. So one, every other week, the, it, a play was in rehearsal and then it was performed the following week. And it was actually really wonderful. So he became an acting member. <coughs> and he was, uh, they were putting on a play by two American playwrights, and I'm sorry, I don't remember their names. I went to see if they had archives, but I couldn't find archives for the theater. And he had to play the Conjure Man in a play about Barbara Allen. And the authors of the play were in the theater. So they wrote their next play for him specifically, and it was performed. The world premiere was held at this tiny little theater in Crouch End in North London. One of the things that happened to me in my last two years at school, so we're talking 1953 to 4 to 1955, was that I developed really serious colitis. I couldn't keep anything in and I lost a lot of weight and 
I resorted to crawling up the stairs because that was the only way I could make get up to my room. And Wendell was learning his parts. So I'd sit in the garden and I'd read all the other parts in order to give Wendell his cues for his part. And that happened two years running because the following year I had a serious appendectomy and the same thing while I was recuperating. I was spending time running through plays with Wendell. I was there, he was there when I was 16. He stayed with us off and on for three years. He was accepted in Glasgow, and while he was in Glasgow, he played Abraham Lincoln on stage, and also played him for BBC Scottish Radio. And a friend of his, Jerry, came to stay, and um, he stayed, essentially, he was staying for us, with us for a couple of weeks. And he said he was leaving to see Wendell at Stratford, and then he was going to Ireland. He had a motorbike that was parked in our front garden. And he, one day I was giving him directions to get to somewhere in Chelsea. And he said, well, why don't you just hop on the back of the bike? And this was before helmets and anything. I said, oh, okay, we can do that. The only time that it was slightly scary was when we turned onto the Thames embankment and were going in the wrong direction. <laughs> but that was all. So after his trip, at least a few days, so we thought he'd only been to Stratford, he came home and his and mother said, Jerry, I thought you were in Ireland. Oh, I've done Ireland, Mrs. Colley. So he had ridden his bike all around Ireland. Who knows what he had seen or enjoyed. He certainly would not have had the time to go to the gate or abbey theatres. Two weeks before my last day at school, my mother told me that she could not afford an entire school uniform and that I would have to leave school. So my big dreams of either working for UNICEF or becoming a teacher were dash, just dashed to the ground. So I had two weeks in which to find a job. You know, talking is very drying. <laughs> and so what could I do the only thing I knew how to do, because I had pretty much mothered, as I was nine years old, I was, had pretty much mothered my younger brother, Stuart, and I thought, well, I'm going to go down to the newsagent and get a magazine called The Lady. Now, The Lady is for upper class and, up, and upper middle class people who are looking for mother's helpers or different kinds of people to work and often live in the home. So I bought the magazine and I went home and I chose two positions to apply for. One was in Stratford and it was a love, in a lovely genuine Tudor house that had, oh it was a lovely house and it was enough out of Stratford that I couldn't figure out if I wanted to be, I mean a Londoner after all, be that remote from life. <coughs> then I applied for a job with a couple, business couple, who had two children, Anne and Clive. And I met the children and had an interview. And I said, you know, I left school before I could finish taking my ordinary levels, GCEs, General Certificate of Education, and I would like to take them as a private student. And, and I said, they will probably happen in October no, or November. There won't be very much notice. So I'll have to be there. And she agreed. So when I got home, I told mother all the things that had happened, how I was being earning, described my room to her. And it had been arranged. I'd have Wednesday afternoons off and all day Sunday. And um, mother called her 
and talk to her about the possibility of my taking exams, so everything I had agreed. What I think actually was pretty amazing was that my mother allowed me to do the negotiations before she followed up on them. So I went, I did eventually go to work for them. But I have to tell you, there was a, a habit with all the girls at school. There was a huge fire bell on the second floor. The second floor was where the headmistress's office and the staff, teacher's staff rooms were. And we were on a trimester system. So that meant that for 17 times at that point, kids had been ringing the fire bell. So on my last day at school, I thought I was asked to make sure nobody rang it. And here I was, standing under the very thing that I had wanted to ring 17 times previously. So I got the handle, grabbed the knot, and I went, practically swinging on it with such enthusiasm. And of course, Miss Lewis, the deputy headmistress, came along. And she said, Veronica, you're the kind of girl that would pull a fire alarm in the street and run away. What, really? So, if I can find it here. I don't need to find it. Um, my last day at school was July 27, 1955. And that weekend, I had started work. My mother had a favorite song. And I'm going to have a go. So, my apologies to Kathleen Ferrier. <laughs> Last night I was told there were ships in the offing, and I hurried down to the deep rolling sea. But my eye could not see it, wherever might be it, the bark that is bringing my true love to me. Blow the wind southerly, 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 Blow the wind southward and bring him to me. Last night I was told there were ships in the offing and I hurried down to the deep rolling sea. But my eye could not see it wherever might be it. The bark that is bearing my true love to me. reception out here for you all to greet Ronnie here and thank you Service League for putting that on for us. And thank you for your lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming.